Good evening and welcome to the Frank Islam Athenaeum Symposia. We are in our 12th semester and sixth year and we've had over 60 speakers and all of them have been experts in various topics including the arts, economics, literature, politics, international relations. And we want to welcome you here and thank you for coming. It's a beautiful evening. I know you probably would like to be outside. Uh, but we thank you for coming. We know that it's going to be worth your while when you hear Vade Ratner. We are here tonight to listen to Vade Ratner, who will discuss her new book about Com Cambodia, Music of the Ghosts. And she discusses the aftermath of the Khmer Rouge re regime and genocide. Vade Ratner has courageously taken on a complex and difficult subject of justice for the Cambodian people. As James Baldwin has stated, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. In Vide Ratner, we have an author who has courageously faced atrocities and torture, and we know that her words will result in a positive change in our global society. Here to introduce author Vade Ratner is our esteemed colleague, fabulous teacher, mentor, and author, political science professor, Jennifer Haydell. Good evening. We're happy to welcome Vade Ratner, an inspiring novelist and a friend of Montgomery College. Uh, at the front of the room, we've been showing you a small sampling of student projects inspired by Vade Ratner's first novel, In the Shadow of the Banyan. Starting in 2013, a number of Montgomery College students have read In the Shadow of the Banyan in a variety of classes, ranging from environmental biology, to history, to international relations, to English, to art, to anthropology, and that's not the full list. <laughs> we hope that the work our students have done over the past four years honors Ratner's own efforts, as she herself describes them, to give voice to the memories of all those silenced. Vade Ratner was a young child when the Khmer Rouge came to power in Cambodia in 1975. She and her mother survived and fled Cambodia, arriving in the United States as refugees in 1981. She graduated from Cornell University, specializing in Southeast Asian history and literature. Ratner's first novel, In the Shadow of the Banyan, received critical acclaim. Not only did the novel become a New York Times bestseller, it was selected as a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award and for the 2013 Indies Choice Book Award. In the Shadow of the Banyan was selected as a common reading at many colleges and universities, including Georgetown University and Kalamazoo College. It was also selected as a big read title by the National Endowment for the Arts. Ratner's second novel, which just came out, has already been well received. The library journal writing about music of the ghosts wrote that Ratner's sophomore title should place her squarely alongside Yi Yun Li, Khaled Hosseini, and Chimamandi Ngozi Adichie, writers who have miraculously rendered inhumanity into astonishingly redemptive literary testimony. As our art and anthropology students wrote in response to reading In the Shadow of the Banyan, Ratner's work consistently reminds us that expressive culture is the creative force in the face of destructive force. Please join me in welcoming Vade Ratner. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Is the microphone supposed to be on? Uh oh, louder? Yes? Left? No, it's supposed to be this one, I think, I'm told, right? <laughs> or this one? This one? Okay, great, 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 great. Wow, wow, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, how lovely to actually see some familiar faces. Um, it's truly wonderful for me to um, be back. <laughs> At the, <laughs> are we done? <laughs> oh, quite acrobatic there. <laughs> Um, 
It's truly wonderful for me to be back at the uh, symposium. It was four years ago that you invited me to uh, speak about uh, In the Shadow of the Banyan. I'm so pleased uh, to have an opportunity now to speak on the themes of my second novel, Music of the Ghosts. A special thank you to Professor Joan Nake and uh, Professor uh, Jennifer Hedell um, and all those involved in um, organizing this evening's uh, talk. Um, please accept my heartfelt gratitude. In the Shadow of the Banyan, as uh, many of you know, um, is a novel based um, directly on my experience as a child living through the Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia. My paramount purpose for writing um, that book was to honor the lives lost, to honor the courage and love that made my own survival possible. In the Shadow of the Banyan is a story of survival. Music of the Ghosts is about the survivors, people like myself who um, were victims but also people who took part in the violence by varying degrees of choice and coercion. It's about the lives that endure after such trauma and the questions that haunt us. One of the two central characters of the novel is um, an elderly half-blind man living on the grounds of the temple in Phnom Penh, the capital city of Cambodia. Disabled and impoverished, the elders uh, survive by playing traditional music for various rituals and ceremonies. He's known to those around him only as the old music musician. The other central character is a Cambodian American woman in her 30s who fled to Cambodia as a child refugee and is now returning for the very first time after more than two decades from the safety of her adopted home in America. The story um, is told in their alternating perspectives. I will read to, to you now excerpts from the beginning of the novel, first from the perspective of the old musician and then from the perspective of Atira, the young woman. He feels his way in the confined space of the wooden cottage, hands groping in the dark, searching among the shadows through the blurred vision of his one good eye for the Sidi. The lute has called out to him in his dream, plucking its way persistently into his consciousness until he's awake aware of its presence beside him. It lies aslant on the bamboo bed, deeply reposed in its dreamlessness. His fingers inadvertently brush against the single copper string, coaxing a soft thought similar to the click of a baby's tongue. The old musician is almost blind, his left eye damaged long ago by a bludgeon and his right by age. He relies much on his senses to see, and now he sees her, feels her presence, not as a ghostly apparition overwhelming the tiny space of his cottage, nor as a thought occupying his mind, but as a longing on the verge of utterance, incarnation. He feels her move toward him, she who will inherit the Sidi, this ancient instrument used to invoke the spirits of the dead, as if in that solitary note he has called her to him. He lifts the lute to his chest, rousing it from its muted sleep, holding it as he often held his small daughter a lifetime ago, her heart against his heart, her tiny head resting on his shoulder. Of all that he's tried to forget, he allows himself, without reservation, without guilt, the reprieve of this one memory, the curve of her neck against his, paired in the concave and convex of tenderness, as if they were two organs of a single anatomy. 
he plays the song he wrote for her. Upon her entry into his world, into his solitary existence as a musician, I thought I was alone. I walked the universe looking for another. He remembers the day his daughter, he remembers the day he brought his daughter home from the hospital, her breath so tenuous still. He wanted to buttress it with notes and words. I came upon a reflection and saw you standing at the fringes of my dream. He often dreams of her, not his daughter, but the little girl to whom this lute rightly belongs, except she's no longer a little girl. He wonders about the person she's become, the woman she's grown into. He dares not confuse one with the other, the young daughter he lost long ago, and the woman he now waits to meet. They are not the same person, he reminds himself. They are not. And you, you are not him, the father she lost. Sometimes, though, his memory rebels. It contrives again, tricking him into believing that the past can be altered. He can amend, atone. But for what exactly? A betrayal of oneself, one's conscience? Was that what he had hoped when he decided to write to her, to seek forgiveness for his crimes? Or was it simply, as he said, that he wished to return the musical instruments her father had left for her? He thinks again of the letter, what it almost revealed. I knew your father. He and I were. His failing eyesight had required him to enlist the help of a young doctor to write those words. He told Dr. Narun to cross out the incomplete sentence. When he had finished dictating the rest of the letter, the doctor wanted to copy it onto fresh, clean paper without the crossed out words. The old musician would not allow it. He would send it as, he, as it was, with a mistake, as if he wanted her to see the duplicity of his mind, the treachery of his thoughts. He and I were what they were, men, animals, two sides of a single reality, was destroyed with one deliberate stroke, the laceration made by a moving blade. He glides the fingers of his left hand closer to the gourd sound box, producing a periodic overtone, like an echo or ripple in the pond. I thought I was alone. I walked the universe, looking for your footsteps. I heard my heart echo and felt you knocking on the edge of my dream. The quality of each note, its resonance and tone, varies as he slides the half-cut gourd across his chest. He plucks faster and harder, reaching a crescendo. Then in three distinct notes, he concludes the song. And now from Tira. Tira feels a hand on her arm. She looks up and sees the flight attendant smiling at her. The young woman reminds her to bring her seat to an upright position. The plane has begun its descent into Phnom Penh International Airport. A terrain of slender sugar palms and straw huts comes into view, desolate and scarred, the earth a deep saffron color. For some reason, Tira expects to see more green, to be greeted by a lush tropical landscape of coconuts and teaks, emerald rice paddies, lakes and ponds filled with lotus and water lily. Instead, what lies below resembles a battleground, pockmarked by dark water holes and bomb crater-like gashes, a fractured geography. What can it tell her? What lies beneath those patches of gray and brown? What secrets does this wounded earth hold for her that she doesn't already know? Does it conceal in its crevices her father's dying scream, his shattered ideals and dreams, evidence of his alleged crime, the possibility of his redemption, as well as her own. The plane swoops down, then touches ground with a light bump. Her heart skips a beat. Tira, Tira clutches her shoulder bag to still herself. Inside are the valuables, her passport, some cash, and a couple of credit cards 
the old musician's letter. My dear young lady, I don't know how to properly begin this letter. She's read it so many times that she can recall it word for word. There is so much to say. It isn't a long letter, but the empty spaces between the lines resonate with inexpressible sadness, their parallel sorrows. I knew your father. He and I were. The words were crossed out, a single straight line running through them, as if the mistake was immutable, impossible to obliterate or retract by a new beginning. Tira was touched by its honesty, its self-revelation when she first read it. We were in Kampung Thom together during the last year of Pol Pot's regime when Selaslat died, a prison. How I survived such a place, I do not know. Why I survived at all is a question that has plagued me until now. Tira feels the aircraft coming to a full stop. I don't know how much time is left or if it is already too late. I have in my possession three musical instruments that once belonged to your father. He would have liked you to have them. He would have liked you to know that some part of him lives, even if only in these instruments. In her mind, Tira hears the music of her father, Sadi. She doesn't know why, but of all the instruments he played, she remembers the sound of this ancient lute most vividly. She remembers a song, not its name, but its melody, each note like a drop of pre-dawn rain on bamboo. She closes her eyes and lets the melody wash over her. As the story unfolds, um, we learn that Tira and the old musician are drawn to each other not only by um, their hidden interwoven history and by remembered melodies, but also by the questions they ask themselves. How do we account for the crimes we have committed knowingly? and for the suffering we contribute to perhaps without knowing. What does it take to atone? What is possible to forgive? And what hope can there be for justice? Personally, as a survivor of war and revolution and genocide, I'm drawn to these questions not because I have ready answers, but because I believe it's so vitally important that we ask as individuals and as societies. Perhaps, um, like myself, some who gather here tonight have come from places with their own histories of turmoil and uh, conflict. Even those fortunate enough to have lived a relatively comfortable life cannot help but recognize that our world is increasingly interconnected whether we travel or stay in one place, we come into contact daily with those, with people of different backgrounds, um, experiences, and beliefs. Not all of us, like the characters in my novel, are re refugees of war or survivors of atrocity. Still, even the most privileged among us, no matter where we live, over the course of a life, cannot escape heartbreak and loss. If we pay attention to the ones we love, if we're alert to the world we live in, we will confront pain and suffering. And how we respond can either um, deepen that suffering or pave the way toward healing. Writing in the shadow of the Bannon, I drew largely on my own personal history with music of the ghosts. I uh, depicted place, uh, I've depicted places that go far beyond my own direct experiences, Place, places like um, the Khmer Rouge uh, rebel camp in the jungle, the prison cell, the torture chamber. I feel a duty to imagine the depths of the inhumanity that others have endured in order to recognize and speak 
to their enduring humanity. It will soon be 40 years since the end of the Khmer Rouge rule. Most people living in Cambodia today um, weren't alive at that time, yet they are still suffering the aftermath. Many Cambodians explain it as a matter of karma, the belief that as individuals and as a society, we pay for our deeds, if not in this life, then in the next. Whatever one believes about uh, rebirth, to me this much is clear. The wrongs of one generation are suffered by the next. This is true whether we are speaking of war, the refugee crisis, or degradation of the environment. We must accept that the consequences of our actions or inactions will be felt by the next generation and for generations to come. Yet how do we seek justice when the rule of law is failing? What if the wounds are so profound that law alone is insufficient to the task of healing. Consider this passage later in the novel when the old musician is in conversation with um, the abbot of the temple where he's um, been given refuge. We inflict suffering because we are afflicted, says the abbot. Round and round it goes. How then do we get out of this wheel, this spinning in circles, and find justice? Perhaps it lies in this venerable. In the probing itself, we become adept not so much at escaping punishment, but at escaping reflection. We fear to plumb the dark and see ourselves in it, the role we play in its creation because if we go to that depth again, we may not be able to resurface, to return to light. The old musician keeps his gaze down, struggling to articulate each thought, fighting the despair that threatens to smother him, send him back into his habitual silence. As for justice, I've tried to comfort myself with the thought that perhaps it is like love. It transcends generations. If we fail to realize it in our own lifetime, perhaps those who come after us will know it. Finally, he looks up, leaving to face the abbot now. When I think of the suffering, the countless lives lost and broken, I'm left with this profound hope that someday there will exist a world where justice is not simply the exchange of a life for a life, an ideal of retribution to right or wrong, but a path one walks and lives, a way of being. I myself don't pretend to know the answers to how a society can find justice, how individuals can atone or forgive or when punishment is um, justified. Instead, what I'm aiming for with Music of the Ghosts is to prompt reflection. In my native tongue, Khmer, the word uh, at for atonement is somto. It means to ask, literally, for punishment. It also means to accept responsibility. It requires an acknowledgement of one's wrong. Recognition of one's wrong requires a very personal probing. An adversarial system of justice isn't designed for that. It certainly isn't designed to achieve it on a societal scale. I come from a country that was so profoundly torn apart and where the rule of law is so weak, where the numbers of victims and perpetrators of violence are so vast that even today, four decades later, the questions of uh, accountability, justice, and reconciliation remain largely unresolved. 
the search for justice requires a society to engage in probing reflection about the past and to draw on its reservoir of compassion in moving toward a more just and hopeful future. That's true for Cambodia, as it is for so many countries overturned by violence. And I believe it's true for America as well, where past injustices continue to animate so many present conflicts, both at home and in the broader world. In Music of the Ghosts, I hope in some small way to foster this spirit of probing reflection, to promote an understanding of the consequence of the choices we make, and most important, our capacities for transformation. I have dedicated Music of the Ghosts to the lives and the beauty that inspired its pages. I would like to close my talk now with one short passage, um, this final passage from the novel that reflects the awe and inspiration I draw from my homeland every time I return um, to my country. This is what I often see in, it, in its many manifestations. They've reached an intersection there are neither traffic lights nor stop signs, but like all the cars around them, they slow to a crawl. Looking past the couple of cars ahead of them, Tira expects to see a motorcade escorting a convoy of armored Fort Rangers favored by high-ranking officials and oligarchs, or worse, a Hummer barreling down at 60, 80 kilometers an hour in his own marked 20. No such vehicle emerges. Instead, she notices an old man, tall and stately, but otherwise dressed in the patched fur clothes of a mendicant, a bamboo cane in one hand, and a cotton satchel on his shoulder. He takes a cautious step from the sidewalk into the humming traffic, then pauses, tapping the bamboo cane on the asphalt, swinging it from right to left, his head cocked to one side, listening, observing with all his senses. Then he lifts his free hand straight past his head and proceeds forward, weaving across the intersection. He's blind, Tira realizes in astonishment. Though he can't see, he raises his arm in the air so others can see him. Everything stills inside her. In this chaotic little city where traffic stops for no one, except out of fear for those with power and fatal accidents occur daily, so it can seem human lives are as dispensable as those of chickens and pigs on their way to slaughter. This mute gesture feels like a revelation of sorts. Tira knows in this very instant that if all she has to take with her when she leaves this land is the image of the raised hand. She will have gained more than what she came with. She may never fully grasp the source of inhumanity, what drives the people to massacre one another, the potential for hate that lurks in every heart, or at what point ideals turn rancid with venom so that they poison and corrupt, murder the very beauty they aspire to create. What is clear before her is the simple fact that it takes conviction to do what this blind man does. In the absence of sight, when all is dark around you, it takes a deep-seated belief that others will answer your appeal, that their humanity will rise to meet your lifted hand, your raised hope. And in that brief moment, you cross the otherwise arbitrary divide between death and life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will take some questions from the audience now. Yes, please. Please use the microphone. I don't know where it is, but please use the microphone. <laughs> yes. 
any questions? Anyone? Anything you would like to ask me about music of the ghost itself? Oh, sure. to your country, and what kind of emotions did you have going back? Did you have fear, anger? You just, you seem so comfortable and reflective about your experience, but um, I wondered if you could talk more about what it was like going back the first time. Okay, um, I went back in 1992 so about a decade after, um, let's see, I arrived in this country in um, 1981. Um, we left Cambodia in 1979. I went back in 1992. It, um, well, let me, let me describe the journey a little bit from the beginning. Um, I knew the very, f um, that I had to, to go back to Cambodia um, as soon as uh, it was safe enough. And uh, I learned that um, when I was a student at Colton College, um, I discovered that the, the one way to get to Cambodia was to go through um, uh, Vietnam. You cannot go through to Cambodia directly. And so I applied for the study abroad program to go to Vietnam. And I thought, okay, during break, I'm just gonna sneak over to, um, and to Cambodia. But my mother knew that um, I wanted to go back. And my purpose was to look for my father. I told myself I wouldn't get emotional. So um, when she dropped me off at the airport, in Minneapolis, she cried and cried and cried and said, why are you doing this? You know, I risked everything to get you out of that place and now you were going back. And there was never a mention yet at that point of me going back to Cambodia, but she knew that was my intention. So, you know, this is decades later and I'm still emotional, you can imagine what it was like for me to go back. When I went back um, there, the sense that I got was um, that this was a country of graves, um, that it was, that everything was destroyed, that, that something as essential as the soul was missing, um, and 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 I think it was it was that time that I recalled my recalled my childhood self again, that ability to learn to see what is invisible, meaning the 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 members of my my family that were buried there. Sorry. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> I'm sorry, where's the question coming from? I can't, oh, sorry. Um, I uh, met with uh, uh, some relatives um, uh, through various uh, contacts that my mom pointed me to. So, yeah. was, was the uh, final sense of fulfillment in not taking more or less with Oh yeah, I mean, there's there's a sense of of a profound reconnection, and I think you can't help but feel that, uh, you know, if if um, you're the one who escaped, yeah, survived and escaped, and um, you know, the rest is back uh, is back there, and and you know, though they um, most were not alive, um, you. You, you feel connected to, to the living as well as to, to the dead. Um, 
you know. And, and you know, if if you're asking, you know, the sense of connection in terms of the sense of healing, I think you can never truly, truly, completely heal from um, an experience like this. There will always the wounds are gone, uh, or at least they're underneath the, uh, they are underneath the scars, you know. But that scar become um, these scars become um, a, a kind of badge of honor, in a sense, you know, a reminder of to 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 live a life of, of peace, to to be conscious that um, you yourself have the potential to hate, to to inflict violence, and you you keep that in mind, and so you try to act in a way that that diminish that potential for violence, for, for hate. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, if you could please go to the microphone, sorry. Oh, oh sorry, yes. It's wonderful to see you again. Uh -huh, I was no, wondering I'm... if you can take us a little bit through the creative process of transforming these brutal historic events into a literary work of art? I think um, the very first feeling that um, comes to me is probably a sense of duty, that um, this life is a gift to, to me, that, um, that somehow I ought to find a way to, to honor that gift. And that gives me a sense, um, a determination to, to create, I think, what was destroyed. And so, and then comes the discipline, the sitting down every morning, trying to write, and to, um, take these two parallel journeys of going so deeply personal that you feel that you are living that experience again, whether it is through the memories of what you have lived through or through the characters that you're creating in the process of creating. But this other journey of being conscious that you are now trying to invoke a world of reality, not only for yourself, but for others who also seek to understand this experience. So you have to go um, uh, beyond it as just writing a novel or, or just the act of um, writing, but it's actually for me the act of of making alive that world that I that I can inhabit and that I feel that others would want to inhabit it with me. I guess you know to to walk into it with me. That's that's my my creative process, but I think the sense of duty for me is 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 a very big thing. Um, I don't know about other writers. If you ask other writers, they will have different answers. But but for me, I feel like um, that sense of duty is um, requires me to put myself in in their place. Um, in the place of, 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 of um, the characters that I'm writing about, you know. In the case of mu Music of the Ghosts, it's the old musicians whose experience in the Khmer Rouge rebel camp, in the prison cell, in, in the, you know, the interrogation center, the torture uh, chamber. It's not something that I myself had had experience with, but, but it requires a um, the process requires me to go into his place and see it from his perspective. Thank you. My question was, um, uh, 
what is the government like now in your home? Um, and two, the genocide that happened there, was that political or racial in aspect? And uh, the governments there now, how have they accepted your writing? And is it looked on as truth or fiction? So let's see, the first part of the question is, uh, what, what part what of- What form of government? Okay, what form of, of government? Well, um, the, a few days ago, I think the New York Times um, uh, came out with this article about um, 11 years into the Khmer Rouge Tribunal um, with, I think, $300 million only ended up um, uh, with three conviction <laughs> um, and of the top Khmer Rouge leader. And that has a lot to do with the government trying to undermine the justice uh, and the legal system in Cambodia. A huge part of that undermining uh, is motivated by the fact that the government um, uh, is, is, is comprised of former, uh, many former Khmer Rouge leaders. Um, and it's a government that's one of the most corrupted in, in the world. Um, and um, uh, in terms of the second part of your question, what could be the genocide, what motivates um, the two political or racial? It started off more ideologically, but I think with any path of mass atrocity, it begins with rhetoric, ideological, political rhetoric, but then it moves to hate that extends into the racial sphere, the spiritual sphere, the religious sphere, the personal sphere. So I think that's the whole danger about um, the rhetoric of hate is that it doesn't stop with rhetoric. It leads to action. Actions leads to destruction. And destruction leads to um, a society being destroyed and um, uh, needing decades to recover afterward. I'm sorry, the last part of your question? Um, how, is it, how are your books um, being oh. received? Uh, back to fiction and well, you know, do you do you feel any personal um, fear that you have published these books and you wish to return to your country yes. to visit? Yes. <clears throat> well, um, my book um, is received very well by the Cambodian community here, especially the young people whose parents cannot articulate the experience uh, to them. And for the old generation, um, the, I often hear this word. It's so wonderful to um, see that you are writing about a country and you honor it in a way, and yet you're able to portray the tragedy as well. Sometimes, as an outsider, when they look at our country, they see only the tragedy, and they don't know how for the way we see our country. And so that has been very gratifying for me. Um, to answer your questions about how it's received in Cambodia, artists are dismissed um, in general <laughs> in Cambodia. We're overlooked, we're seen as kind of um, this, you know, people who should be pushed to the margin even further until, of course, we start to um, uh, create change uh, for a society. What I think, I'm not even sure if the Cameroonian government is aware um, that um, I'm writing this book, but you know, they may be aware that I'm part of the royal family. They're more concerned about that. 
if my book becomes something of, uh, of uh, something audible to them, but then I'm connected to um, a political group or a group that they uh, perceive as threatening to them, then it can be troublesome for me. Right now, they're, they're not aware of that. You know, when I published my book, there was a bit of a struggle. Should I publish it under my Cambodian name, or should I publish um, uh, with my American name, which is um, for Dave Ratner. Ratner is my, my married name, my husband's last name. Um, and so I decided that, uh, you know, this is also me. And so uh, I write partly as an American, too. This is, you know, I write in the English language. And so that has shielded me a little bit from kind of the possible threat. Um, what has been pleasantly surprising um, for me in terms of its reception in Cambodia, the young Cambodians who are reading um, uh, my, my first book, In the Shadow of the Banyan, in, in, in English, um, they uh, feel not only empowered by the story, but empowered that it's told in a language that the government can't somehow get their uh, understanding um, has their grasp on it yet. So, so that, that's, that, that's been great. And in terms of fear, somebody of my background, I think when politics destroy your society, your country, nearly all your family, you live with that constant fear. Even in America, I'm so um, I'm, I'm so cautious. I'm not as, as vocal as I feel sometimes I should be about, um, I guess, in my political opinion. You know, I, 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 I want to always possess the courage to stand up to, um, to uh, you know, a political system that has committed wrong. That, uh, but in terms of expressing an opinion, I've noticed that among writers that I admire, I feel like they express it so much faster than, than I can. And I'm, I'm always cautious that if this is, I'm always asking myself, is this is what I really want to say? Is, is what I mean, is, is this going to be a criticism or is it a critique? Is this how constructive is it? You know, so that fear is very strong inside of me. It never leaves you. And it's even more so now in some way. But I'm, I live in Malaysia, so please forgive me if I keep asking, can you repeat your questions? Um, there's a 12-hour <laughs> time difference, and I had three hours of sleep last night. <laughs> Jet lag. I came in on Saturday, uh, well, Sunday morning, 12, close to 1 a.m. <laughs> so uh, forgive my um, scattering thoughts sometimes. <laughs> Questions? I don't want to keep you up. But, uh, no, please, uh, please. <laughs> well, you have to keep me up until night time. Right. Today, yes. Um, yeah. It was lovely to hear this passage is read, I, by the way. I think it's oh, thank you. thank you. I have a question about silences. Um, mm. Two weeks ago, the Athenaeum Symposium brought us um, Aminata Forna, who wrote uh, a book. Aminata Forna is her name. Yes, yes. She wrote a book, um, The Devil Who Danced on Water, about the, um, the killing of her distant father in Sierra Leone. Yeah. And, um, and uh, she spoke about these different discrete types of silence. And, um, and they include the silence of fear, I think, the silence of complicity, um, the silence of trauma. Mm -hmm. She wrote another wonderful book, a, a novel about um, Croatia yes. and a, a similar, another civil war, of course. Yeah. And, and it, it involved these silences, too. Um, I, I, it's, it's, it's very striking to me. I, when I was, I taught in, um, in Sri Lanka, and um, I lived in a very small town that had been the epicenter of a, of a, of a major rebellion, th mm -hmm. tens of thousands of people. So, 
um, of a similar nature, uh, by the way, to that in um, Cambodia, interesting one. Mm -hmm. um, and I lived in a house that was um, surrounded on all sides. The, the village could sort of look at me. It had been the headquarters of this um, revolutionary movement, the JVP. Um, and you know, I found it, I, I spoke Sinhala, but mm -hmm. I found it difficult to translate um, the type of silence that I experienced, uh, and I lived there about mm -hmm. eight years after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. I wondered about the silences that you have experienced in Cambodia, of mm -hmm. perhaps whether they are those silences of complicity, of um, trauma, maybe. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that, um, that idea that Aminata Porna brought up yeah. applies yeah. in some ways also to Cambodia. Yeah. I think it depends on the context you're talking about, okay, when silence, I think in the face of injustice, silence is complicity, <laughs> but um, when uh, there's a power, when there's a system or government, an entity that has the ability to take away your voice, your, the silence that you can sum up becomes your own power. Meaning, for me, when I was a child, what was happening around me, the deaths of loved ones, the disappearances of neighbors and, um, uh, and friends, gave me this sense that um, it was an attempt to, to silence me. And so I'm not going to um, give them that satisfaction. So I made the choice first to not talk, and so, you know, to, to just go into myself. And because I don't want a soldier to come one night and gag me and tell me at gunpoint to be quiet um, as I witness um, someone being taken away. And so for me, as a child, I chose silence as a form of empowerment, as a way of into myself. As an adult, I realize that something magical happens when I am silent, I am connected to somehow something that's greater than myself. This feeling that um, there's, there's this fear that I can uh, inhabit and I'm not alone in it. And as, as, as a writer now, um, my voice as a writer has to begin with silence. I have to dive into a place where I reach that silence in order to create. Does that make sense? But those are the different um, um, definitions of silences for me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering about your use of Khmer words yes. in the novel and also in, in The Shadow of the Banyan. Um, what are some ways that the Khmer language is actually influencing your novels or influencing kind of the, the word choice that you're using in the novel? Okay. Um, you know, I'm not a musician, but uh, writing this uh, book, um, Music of the Ghosts, I um, uh, partly it was motivated by uh, my love of well, my, I guess, uh, well, uh, my attentiveness to the musicality of a person's voice and words and phrases and so forth. And I think when I trans, um, when I use my words, um, I want, I think some aspect of, of that, of the musicality of, 
of the phrase of the word has to be there for me first, and then I search for, for, for the meaning that somehow convey the feelings that I hear in, in the Khmer words. Um, Um, during your journey back uh, and through your travels, did you experience like uh, any reluctancy for people to share their experiences with you for fear mm -hmm. maybe of uh, recompense or retaliation mm -hmm. for the events that happened and knowing at the capacity that you were, you were coming, not only to find your father, but um, to exercise your voice in your writing and am I right to, to associate that, you know, th this was a way to also, you know, fuel your voice in your writing? Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, you know, you, you, you ask uh, about is there any reluctance. I think there's still a great deal of reluctance. Um, Cambodians are very f uh, funny in the way they uh, embrace uh, this experience or live um, the Khmer Rouge uh, history, on the one hand, if foreigners ask, we talk and talk and talk endlessly about it, you know, because we've seen these kind of um, uh, easy phrases, uh, you know, that's summed up by newspaper, by television, and we sense that this is what um, the outsiders want us to say, want us to, um, to speak about, you know, but for when we're among ourselves, there's a great deal of reluctance to speak about it. And so for me, when I, every time I go back, I never approach the subject directly. You know, it always starts off as if you're asking, oh, you know, um, where, you know, where's your family from? Um, and, uh, and then, oh, we were from here, but then eventually the conversation leads to, but we were sent there, sent there when? Oh, during the Khmer Rouge, oh, you were there during the Khmer Rouge. Slowly, slowly, and so it can take weeks before um, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the history of that person's um, experience during the Khmer Rouge period uh, would come out. Um, but I feel that uh, for me to write um, these two stories, both In the Shadow of the Banyan and Music of the Ghosts, um, I had to go back and hear the experience uh, the being spoken by Cambodians in their own language. And so I think that's part of also of, of how I, I I choose um, uh, the words of the phrase, and it, some part of my American self plays into uh, what appears in the book. Like, for example, in Music of the Ghost, there's this beautiful phrase um, in Khmer when you're describing um, the grounds of a household or the estate and uh, the word, the breath of water, you know? Uh, and and something like that, I don't know if I only spoke Khmer, whether it would have, uh, whether it would have such a musicality, or I'm hearing it as an English speaker, the breath of water, you know? And so that feeds into my voice as, as a writer. But um, with music of the ghosts more than uh, in the shadow of the banyan, because in the shadow of the banyan was an experience I lived through. With music of the ghosts, I a lot of what Tira's observation, the, the young woman's observations, are drawn from my own life. But for the old musician, it's very imagined. And you know, I talk to demining experts, archaeologists, soldiers. I even though I know the words in English, uh, the, the different um, types of bombs and so forth, I wanted 
to hear the Cambodians talk about uh, the various types of bombs. You know, and there was one day um, in Siem Reap in, um, uh, where uh, I found, um, uh, where I built this relationship with this t taxi driver who um, was actually a former soldier. <laughs> Um, and he took me to a war museum, and he showed me the very um, uh, the different types of weapons and so forth. Um, I, I remember we had a dinner to go to afterward, and I was like in this very nice uh, dress. And then, but he wanted me to 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 really experience how a gun would feel and so forth. And so that was. That was the only time in my life where I hold a, a weapon, you know? And so I had an a, uh, AK-47 on my shoulder, and then I had this long dress, you know? And my uh, daughter uh, aunt, uh, said, Mommy, this photo should never, never appear <laughs> on the internet. It could be misunderstood, you know? But I was, you know, it, it was really important to not only talk to a former soldier, um, he was a demining expert, um, and uh, uh, but now as a taxi driver, and you know he he was very experienced with uh, with the weapons, and I um, I thought it was interesting, you know, how some of um, the types of uh, anti-personnel mines have very friendly benign names like um, um, the areca box, the beater box that old people use for putting their chewing um, ingredients. And, uh, but there was this type of, of mine and that was called that. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, and I spoke to archeologists, you know, to um, just, just to hear how um, archaeology would be spoken in, in Khmer, even though I've read many books about archaeology in Cambodia. And so that, that really kind of adds to, to the voice, too. But when, when, when you write a novel, you create characters that rival with your, um, characters who rival with your own um, real friends, <laughs> you know? And so, um, you're not conscious of your voice anymore. Um, there are different voices in, in, in the novel. Um, yes. Good day. Hi, Anita. How are you? Thank you for coming. <laughs> well, we didn't want to miss this. And oh. by the way, everybody in the neighborhood says hi. <laughs> okay. We yeah. spoke about you at the last cocktail yeah. party. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Please tell them that um, they're moving. My publisher is uh, having me uh, in one city a day. So tomorrow I saw your I schedule. Leave. Yes. yes. So I, you know, as much as I would love to visit everyone. Okay. Yeah. Um, my question was based on the previous question when yeah. you were asked if there's reluctance from people to talk about the past. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if the reluctance was because of fear, because you had mentioned about the corrupt government that there is presently, and a lot of people are previous Khmer Rouge, you know, personnel. So is there any fear, like people, you know, not expressing and talking about what they went through I, or no? Oh, well, I think that certainly true for Cambodians in um, Cambodia. Yeah. There's still a great deal of fear. Um, uh, we've lived with that for so long, but I think what I observed um, with perhaps, uh, we don't have the same kind of fear in America for, for Cambodians in America that we fear reprisal from um, the government in Cambodia. But I think this is not specific to um, Cambodians, the reluctance, I, I feel that when you have been exposed to the extremes, what the extremes of human brutality defy speech. You know, it's just there's no way to talk about it. It's, it's 
How can you talk about something that feels unspeakable and describable and you feel that you know it, you know it expression only because you witness, you know, these acts, these expressions of, of violence, of brutality. But there's, there's just, there's just not speech for it. I, I feel that that's a huge part of it, and I don't think it's specific to to Cambodia. I've seen it with you know, um, Holocaust victims as well. Um, that the older generations, the survivors of the Holocaust, had oh, you know, would have hard time talk, talking about it. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.